This is an ABC podcast. Someone once said a million years ago that the English language can be understood anywhere in the world so long as it is spoken loudly and clearly. Well, that's not true at all, is it? But it does say something about the way that English has, for better or worse, become the closest thing we have to a global language. And it's strange when you think that it all came out of a small and damp island on the periphery of the world in the early Middle Ages. The island was invaded again and again, with each invader adding something new to the language. And then the English built a navy, they industrialised, became very powerful and were able to export the language by consent or by force all over the world, even to the faraway island continent of Australia, where it reached new heights of perfection. Kate Burridge is Professor of Linguistics at Monash University in Melbourne. Kate has appeared many times on ABC Radio, taking listeners' questions about the ways we use English to communicate, but also to obfuscate and to hide things that we'd rather not talk about. Kate has long been fascinated by the way that language changes over time, how words and phrases slide in and out of everyday speech, and what that might tell us about our secret desires and fears. Hello, Kate. Hello, how are you, Richard? Very well, thank you. Good. When you look at our language, or language mm-hmm. in general, I suppose, how do you see it? Do you see it as being like some kind of a city of words that sort of builds up and is demolished over time? Or is it? Or do you see it more like an <laughs> overgrown garden? I think the overgrown garden is the best best image of all. It's, it's very much like a garden. And... Uh, I came to realise that, in fact, when I started to hang out in nurseries, you know, as you do when you reach a certain age and suddenly nurseries have this attraction. But then I realised how good the garden image was for particularly bridging what seemed to be quite a a big gap between, you know, my group of linguists and then the, the wider community. Because I think when people generally think about the English language, they think about the standard language, you know, so they think about dictionaries and they think about grammar books. And that's very much like the manufactured garden, isn't it? Or the the cultivated garden that's fenced off from the outside. Uh, But at linguists see language, the English language or all language as this kind of social phenomenon that kind of evolves and adapts and hybrid changing all the time. Uh, it, this is your overgrown garden. This is, you know, full of weeds. And weeds is a very good mm. image as well because, of course, what is a weed but, a you know, a plant that's growing in the wrong place? Uh, even serious tomes on weeds talk about them in that way and that's what linguistic weeds are, you know. So, you know, my weeds aren't necessarily your weeds and the weeds of, you know, the early language that you mentioned, um, you know, are no longer the weeds of today. So it's, it's very much in flux. And, you know, as you say that, I'm thinking of that famous statement of Edmund Burke the British statesman who said mm-hmm. he thought the English, I think, were naturally resistant to fascism because of their gardens. He said, you look at the French, <laughs> they, they bag gardens and everything's like Versailles, you know. It's like everything's in straight lines yes. and right angles and everything's trimmed to within an inch of its life. Yeah. That made left them wide open to fanatics and, and Napoleon, he said. Whereas he says, the English, though, they're like a wandering path, something that's more <laughs> overgrown yes. and uh, is it, more ready to embrace uh, chaos and windy, bendy bits. I don't, know, I don't know. What do you think about all that, Kate? Oh, I think, you know, I, I gather that there were great gardening debates in the 17th and 18th <laughs> century about <laughs> what was the proper garden, you know? Was it something that embraced nature and the wildness of nature or was it? And I think William Morris was one of these that, that wanted it to be absolutely fenced off from the outside. You know, he had all of these prescriptions about what should be in a garden, you know, not not scarlet flowers, not this and that. And it reminded me very much of, well, of the, what was happening to English at that time because, of course, people were laying down rules left, right and centre. Um, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, it was a time when, you know, dictionaries as we know them were starting. Uh, so we were getting our, our, our work of art, our, our manufactured garden uh, yeah, I, language. I th- you see, I think I'm big on rules for the English language, just my rules though. I don't <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there was one, one um, what was his name, Marriott, uh, a novelist uh, of early times of the early modern period and he supposedly said said, my speech is pure, thine wherein it differs from mine is corrupt. In fact, he never said that, but he did say something like that, but that's often quoted has been over the years. He was right. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> so long as he means me, and you, of course, yes. as well. Yes. That's right. Now, I hope I'm not misquoting him here, but Richard Flanagan, the, the author, once once told me this, that, that his father, who 
grew up without much money in Tasmania, once said to him that uh, he loved words, he says, because there was no money around and words were the first most beautiful things that he knew. Mm. Was that you? I loved words, that's for sure, but I, I'm one of these um, strange creatures that loves grammar, I have to say. I love the way we put words together and I'm fascinated by the way grammar changes over time. You know, I'm fascinated by the fact that, I don't know, a good example would be the, the negative construction. You know, you think that would be fairly stable aspect of the language, how we negate things, but in the history of English, of recorded English, um, you know, it's changed four times that how we how we mark negation. So we used to say, you know, put the negator before the verb, no, no, and then we'd have no, no, not. We'd kind of wrap it around the verb like the French do, and then we'd drop the no, so we have I know not, and then that became, that fell out, you know, and we've got I don't know now. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's going to change again. So I find that really interesting. These are the aspects of language that are kind of more than skin deep, or the kind of deep grooves of language, as one linguist once described. Yeah. Well, there was, the, the, of course, the Australian version of that is to put but at the end of the sentence, like, I yes. don't know, but. And then Queenslanders put the A as well, so I don't know, but A. Um, uh, and that's fascinating because but, as you know, is a, is a thing that gloms clauses together normally. But what happens with even grammatical things is that over time they become more kind of anchored in the world of the speaker, more subjective, more, you know, more like an attitude marker. And that's what that but is there. So that, that, that can happen, that, that these things will not just change in the way they behave grammatically, but their meanings become quite different. So that, that but at the end is really very different from the but that's at the beginning of the clause. So, so are you saying that when you put the but at the end of the sentence, you're not just trying to impart the meaning of the sentence, you're also letting the listener know that I don't really care for whatever ideas you might have yep. of fancy mm. grammar. It means a bucket load of things, and people have been <laughs> have been studying that little. But it's like, yeah, no. I mean, you can have yeah, and you can have no, and then you can put them together, and it's you can have kind of concrete meanings of yeah, no, you know, affirmation or, or negation. But then, yeah, nah, down the track, in a, it means something completely different, and it's very, very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's indifference, isn't it? Yeah, nah, yeah, nah, it was good. Yeah, that kind of. You know, it can be, it's it's become a very important part of the kind of complementing routines in Australian English, you know, because it's not, it's, compliments are hard things because you don't want to stand out, you don't want to skite, but you've got to, you've got to accept that compliment because otherwise you're not being gracious. So yeah, accepts the compliment, but nah, it's usually followed with a whole, yeah, nah, but I, you know, if someone says, oh, you're looking, you know, it's a fabulous frock, and you say, yeah, nah, it's something I just you know, dragged out of the cupboard. Or, <laughs> you hear it a lot in sporting commentary. So so when you say, yeah, when someone says that's a nice frock, and you go, yeah, nah, it's all right. That's, that's again, that's got all sorts of meanings packed into it. One is like, mm. thank you for your kind words. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed by them. Yep. Uh, I don't want to seem like I'm up myself. No, that's right. Exactly. So you're playing down the compliment. It's become a sort of part of the, the routine of, of compliments in Australian English. But that's just one function of Yena. We could spend the rest of the time, Rich. No, I need to know. What, and... what are the other functions of Yena? I need to know. Oh, well, one of the main ones is to return to an earlier topic. So you and I could be talking about, I don't know, grammatical change, and then I go off on a tangent, and then you say, yeah, no, but grammatical change is a, you know, so, so in other words, come back to the topic. That's, you know, and that, yeah, acknowledges, you know, looks like there's some sort of link there between what I was saying and what you were saying. In fact, there was none, probably. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really interesting. And the other thing about them is it, uh, the yeah, nah, is it can be a very emphatic yes. Did you have a good time? Yeah, nah, I had an absolute ball. <laughs> <laughs> but by and large, there's a gentleness to it, though, that mm. I hadn't seen, I don't think, until you yes, just pointed that out. it is. It's part of the verbal cuddling strategy of Australian <laughs> English. Very important. <laughs> when you were studying grammar at school, did you study grammar at school? Was there grammar at school when you were, when you were a kid? You know, in primary school, I do recall spending a fair bit of time parsing, you know, <laughs> sentence and extension, uh, those sorts of activities that are so so remote. And uh, You mean breaking yeah. a sentence down to objects, subjects, nouns, verbs, adjectives, that sort of thing? Yes. I don't know that we got too far into it. But then, you know, I, it was a time when the whole language awareness, knowledge about how speech and language works was kind of being dumped from the school curriculum, not just in Australia. It was all around the English-speaking world that's that happened. And so really I came to... Um, 
understand or, or, or get excited by English, actually, by learning other languages. And that's how, and that's unfortunately how a lot of people came to understand their language was through the eyes of another language because they didn't grow up with this, unfortunately. It's coming back slowly into the school curriculum, but it's a, it's a sad thing. What was the thinking at the time that, that led to people concluding that grammar was not as important as it had been in the past? Well, I think, you know, the, a few things were going on there. I think they were rightly so that, you know, all you need is to provide a very rich linguistic environment and kids will pick up language, which, of course, they do. But that's very much the spoken language. I know you've written a lot of books and I, I don't know whether you find writing any easier, but I find it very, very difficult. Even, you know, after so many years of writing, writing isn't a natural activity. It's not like spoken language. And, you know, knowing about how language works, opening your eyes, to particularly grammatical structures and, and all of the different ways that we can actually you know, formulate that sentence um, is, is very useful. But unfortunately, people felt at that time that there was no link between knowing that sort of stuff and being able to write well. But instead of throwing it out of the curriculum, I would have perhaps looked at how you, how you were teaching it because, indeed, it was very much through the lens of Latin and, you know, it wasn't tied to any sort of practical aspect, you know, any activities. So, unfortunately, it was allowed to happen and I'm not sure how my profession sort of stood by and let it happen, but it did. Yeah, I, I'm conscious of you saying there that how in, how different it is to speak English and how to, mm. it is to write it. Mm. And it's certainly true that you can do the most wonderful interview, the most wonderful interview that's completely <laughs> compelling. And if you transcribe it exactly, it just looks like crap on the page. It looks yeah. terrible. It looks terrible. <laughs> but on the other hand, having said that, if I'm writing a book, I will, I will, I will actually try and read the whole thing out loud. But mm. my only, my only problem is finding someone who's a member of my family who's prepared to sit still and listen to me talk for that long. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, do you inflict it on others? I do. Do you, I, I, do. I also read out my writing, but only to myself. But uh, <laughs> I have to do that because if you just sit on the page, you don't actually... Yeah, you, things pass. Infelicities of style pass you by. <laughs> so, so when you were at, at school, did you learn another language, and that, did that give you? Has that given you some insight into English and how it operates? Yes, yes. I, I fell in love with German in particular, which is of course a close relative of English. And uh, we had a, a teacher who was very much into grammar. Uh, in fact, my German grammar book was in Gothic script. <laughs> you know, she was pretty old fashioned, and uh, she loved drilling grammar. And I just. Um, I just really loved that. So, you know, that was my, my passion and I went on to, to well, what I did, in fact, was was look at word order over 350 years of, of Dutch. I looked at Dutch rather than English. Dutch was another very close relative of English. Why, why they, Dutch? Well, uh, there were better texts at the time. Of course, that's the problem. You know, how do you get to the spoken language of the day you know beautiful literature is you know is not what you want to look at really um because that's just artificial and things i was looking at word order so word orders are particularly strange in um it can be in literature uh, and so you want something that resembles the spoken language so i was looking at texts of instruction i suppose essentially there were medical books you know brain surgery treatises of the 14th century there were there were <laughs> there were recipe books yes cures um yes 350 years of these and i looked at something like 8000 clauses and looked at how the track the verb from the end of the sentence to earlier in the sentence and I looked at those negative constructions. So when you're speaking German and you're in the German context like Germany say, um, mm. this, is, this gets to the heart of I think of what language is or what linguistics might be. Do you find yourself thinking differently if you're speaking and hearing and writing German than in English? I think if I'm there, in, in, immersed in it, yes, I think that is true. In what um, way? At, the, at, at the moment, it's just a struggle. <laughs> um, the German I've been working on more recently is uh, the German spoken by the what who are sometimes called they call themselves the buggy people, the Amish and Mennonites in North America. So their German is very, very different because their German came across, you know, over three hundred years ago to North America, and it's kind of stuck there. Um, so, and that's just a spoken language. That's not a written language at all. And if I'm, you know, in the in the community for a long, long time, then I just sort of get immersed in it, and I do do seem to think in that language. I seem to dream in that language, and it's it's uh, it's it's interesting. German is often said to be more direct than English. Uh, it's invo it's got less of the kind of 
looping Frenchiness of, um, <laughs> in, of English. <laughs> is that true? And, and does that mean there's less use for things like euphemisms? And, uh, you know, if, do you, you're more likely to call a spade a spade if you're speaking German than you are in English? There certainly is a, a greater directness. I think it shows up in, in well, they certainly have their euphemisms. I think it more shows up in more subtle ways. There's uh, English, for example, if you want to get someone to do something, uh, and this is a point made by a linguist in Canberra, Anna Rizbitska, English has a whole range of what she called wimperatives, wimpish ways of getting <laughs> someone to do something. You know, you don't say shut the window. Um, you say, would you shut the window? Would you mind shutting the window? Could you shut the window? You know, they, would you like they, to shut the window yeah, is something I try right, yeah. and I get it from my family. No, I wouldn't. No. That's right. Are you yes. asking me to shut it? Yes, I am asking you to shut the window. <laughs> All right, then. The origins of the English language, like I said at the start, Britain was, when the Romans came, occupied by Britons who mm-hmm. spoke a Gaelic, Celtic kind yes. of language, different kinds of it in different parts of the, of the British Islands. How much of that remains in English? Can you still hear bits and pieces of the old Gaelic language in English? The bits and pieces that are left are the distinctive intonation patterns and pronunciation features that you really? get in. Yes, so you can hear um, Irish English or Scottish English or something. So there's that kind of Celtic underlay. But other than that, uh, the Celtic language has made very little impression on English. You know, there are a couple of borrowings, um, these these things that linguists curiously call borrowings. Of course, we have no attention to giving them back, but these are the, the loan words that come into the language and there's only a very few of those. There's place names, you know, like the, the te- or river names, the Thames, but uh, yeah, very, very little um, as opposed to, of course, the later languages that English came into contact with, like Viking, Scandinavian and uh, French. Well, the Angles, Angles and Saxons arrived uh, mm-hmm. after the Romans left. Mm-hmm. What kind of language were they speaking when they arrived? A Germanic language or something mm-hmm. else? Yes, it was Germanic. So you had, um, there were, you know, would have been various dialects that came across, but they would have all been mutually understandable. And they would have been mutually understandable too with um, with the Dutch. <laughs> they put Dutch in inverted commas because, of course, it, you know, there was all just one Germanic language with all these different dialects. The, the, the language that the Vikings spoke was most certainly mutually understandable with the English at the time. So, you know, there were more dialects of, of the one language. It's quite tricky when, when dialects start being sort of separate languages that are related. You, usually you say a kind of rule of thumb is mutually understandableness, if that's a word. So as, <laughs> as, one as, they, as soon as they can't, can no longer understand one another, you say, well, well, well we've got two separate languages. <laughs> can we know what Old English sounded like? Oh, well, I could give you a little glimpse of it. Okay, I'll give you a, an example of a, a cure from one of the texts that I, ha- I have been looking at quite recently, in fact. Let's, let's see if you can kind of pick <laughs> any of the English words, actually. The understandable standable out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes, indeed. So it's, with lith werk, you name kulfran tord an tord. So this is, a, this is a, a very brief little remedy for pain, uh, arthritic pain, really. I mean, really? You know, I didn't hear. I heard a welk and a gate in there. That's about yeah. it. <laughs> well, um, you probably. It's actually it was a goat. Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> the gart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so there were a few words in there that are still around, like and. I mean, and is amazing. It was. It was would have been pronounced something like und, but you know who knows with vowels. But it, that's a remarkably stable little word that's been you know around at least a thousand years and longer um, with very little change to it. But there were other words in there like the goat one, gart a torred. This is actually it's part of the dung-based health programs of, of the early Middle Ages. So this was <laughs> the, the excrement of the goat, if I put it. That's politely. a book you can borrow from the library. Yeah. The dung-based medi- medications <laughs> yes, of, right. of oh, early England. Oh, you you wouldn't believe the magic of dung in those days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cheap and there was plenty of it. That's right. That's right. It was good enough for Grandma, it'll be good enough for me. Oh, yes. Well, you put it on the garden and things grow to go back to our garden <laughs> metaphor. So. Then the Vikings came, as you say, and they, mm. they left their own mark. I've been to Iceland a few times and mm. that's, they speak a kind of old Norse there and it's just not that hard to understand the sense of signs mm. and notices around the place. What do we get from them? We got um, a whole lot of things from, from in fact, the, the Scandinavian language at that time. And you're, and you're dead right. The Icelandic language is the most conservative of all of the, the um, North Germanic 
dialects or languages, this gets even more murky when you start looking at Swedish and Norwegian and all those. But um, we, the interesting thing about the contact between the, what the Vikings spoke and the Anglo-Saxons was that the words that came into English from Scandinavian were your basic everyday vocabulary items. So, you know, pronouns, the they, them and their pronouns came in from Scandinavian. Even the verb form are, you know, the um, they are, that, you know, that basic little part of the verb to be. So you were saying there. pronouns came in with the Scandinavians. Before that, people were just using proper names all the time, were they? No, no, just these these three particular oh. pronouns, they, them and their. Um, one of the problems was, well, it actually, from modern spectacles, maybe it wouldn't be such a problem, but we would have had the same pronoun for he, she and they in in early English. Um, so it was actually hay and hem. So uh, it, that was probably why we we stole the three pronouns from the Vikings. Because normally, of course, you wouldn't you wouldn't take on another language's pronouns unless. But it does also suggest that the contact between the Vikings and the Anglo Saxons was very very close, and they were you know very entwined in each other's lives. And it's also interesting. We we have this image of the Vikings, don't we? As so sort of you know ransacking and pillaging, and um, but you, you're not going to give off your pronouns. And also every day words like die, like get, like give, like, oh, basic everyday vocabulary. You're not going to sort of take those up. Oh, I, I don't know if there was any um, early medieval people who loved language as much as the Vikings did, and that's where we get the sagas from. Mm, well, um, indeed, yeah. yes, yes, you're right, yes. But it does suggest, doesn't it, that they were sort of, you know, they, they obviously entered the language at a time when they were living peaceably together um, and very much entwined with each other. You know, in, in terms of everyday life. Well, then in 1066, the <laughs> England was invaded by the Norman French, and that's how, mm. well, I suppose that's how French bits of French came in, into the language. Has there always been this split between Frenchy-type English <laughs> and Germany-type English, whereas mm. the Frenchy-type English is the language of authority and the Germany-type language is the language of the common people? But yes, it was from that time, in fact, when you know something like ten thousand French words just suddenly flooded into English, and suddenly English stopped looking like a Germanic language, and it looked much more like a Romance language, like French. Uh, we just, and it also began our love affair with stealing words from other languages, because we haven't looked back since that time. But you're quite right. What that's done is create this kind of hierarchy, uh, stylistic hierarchy in vocabulary. So your basic everyday words that kind of underlay yeah, sort of ordinary little words like the grammatical words like the, um, you know, like word like book or water or, or and your, your full-blown obscenities, they all come from, um, mm. they're all Germanic and they kind of support this superstructure of words of, also, you said of sort of, what did you say, of force or something, but but they're also of nuance, you know, of, of refinement and, and and we've got lots of examples like that where you can see that the, I don't know, you know, the basic English word is ask, but if you want, you know, a more highfalutin way is to say sort of to question and that's French or inquire um, and that's, you know, so it's, it's they're stylistically different. So they didn't, well, they would have displaced a lot of vocabulary but they also coexisted um, and just were used in different contexts. Don't all the all the shon words come from French, like the T-I-O, the words yes. that end with T-I-O-N, like information? Aren't they mm -hmm. all the French words? They're all the French words, yes, yes. I mean, I'm recently I've been looking, uh, revisiting, in fact, sort of medical language, and you know, we talk about medical English, but you know, very little of it is in fact English. <laughs> it's French or it's Latin that came in by a French. A lot. Of, it's sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's French or a Latin borrowing. That's that's why whenever you get like an official letter from the bank, it's, well, up until recently anyway, it's like, dear sir, madam, we wish to draw your attention to the events, uh, the information circulated to you on such and such a day. Mm -hmm. That's French, lang French court mm -hmm. language designed perhaps yes. to intimidate, maybe. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. It, that's, it started that exactly right. It's sort of linguistic snobbery. That's what it bred. Yes, you can talk about a black eye or you can talk about a circumorbital hematoma. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is so many certain contexts where you want your doctor to know about a circumorbital hematoma. And, and But, you know, there are contexts indeed where you want the basic everyday language. It wasn't it Winston Churchill who in Parliament one day, he's, he wasn't allowed to call his opponent a liar. So instead he said he was guilty 
guilty of uttering a terminological inexactitude. (laughs) That's French too, isn't it? Yes, indeed, or a categorial inaccuracy. (laughs) (laughs) Or you can have English misspeaking themselves, yes. (laughs) So this is something, one of the great legacies of the Norman conquests is this language of the court which mm. is used to sort of just, you know, put yourself over someone else. Yes, or a look, it can even be as basic as uh, take food terms, you know, or, or the meal times. You know, breakfast is is English. Well, it's actually a mixture of English and, and Norse, but it's Germanic. You break the um, fast, yes. Yes, exactly. But the other more sort of, I suppose, posher meal times, you know, that's all French terms, dinner, supper, and, and all of the food terms and the, you know, so it, people often give the example of, of, you know, meat, which when it's the animal, we use the English term like cow or sheep or lamb. And as soon as we turn it into food, it becomes French. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. You can hear more Conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. When you see language being used by powerful people, and we imagine Australia, and to some degree I suppose it's it's true that it's a somewhat more egalitarian place than Britain mm. perhaps or other places. We like to think We it like is to anyone. think that. But do you see it being used <laughs> to look down on people, to intimidate people, to people who might not have the same kind of grasp of English as someone else? It's it's easy, isn't it, as an outsider to think that. Sometimes I think, though, people just get so wrapped up. This is so we're entering the realm of jargon, aren't we? Um, mm. We get so wrapped up in their jargon, which is full of this sort of these expressions that you were talking about earlier, that they don't know. That they don't know, well, A, that it does something to your, the neck hairs of your interlocutor, if I can mm. put it that way. That it really is irritating. But it's also, it's as you say, it's obfuscating. It's a gorgeous word. The word jargon itself goes back to Middle English and it's originally referred to the noises, the chattering of birds. So it's actually related to the word gar- gargle. And, uh, you know, really? Yes. So it was noises made in the throat. You know, that's why it's always had this double life jargon. You know, on the one hand, it's, you know, it's a, you'll see dic- dictionary definitions that say it's a specialist language, you know, it's, it's crucial terms that are used, you know. Uh, but then there's this incomprehensible gobbledygook, you know, because it depends whether you're an insider or an outsider. Yes. <laughs> no place is more likely to employ jargon than a university campus, surely, mm. Kate. Mm. Now, you're the Professor of Department of Linguistics. Uh, I mean, mm. a linguist sometimes called in. Should linguists be a kind of um, uh, an anti-jargon police force on a campus? <laughs> I say yes, Kate, most strongly to that. <laughs> I, I, think, I think people use jargon now, they hide behind it to intimidate oh, yes. or to conceal yes. their own sloppy thinking. I mean, what do you think about all that? Oh, in, indeed. I, I'll never forget when I came across, first came across, um, what was it, auto-condimentation in the hamburger industry. You know, that was the to distinguish the client's right to salt his or her own hamburger. You know, and I thought, really, do you need it? <laughs> and, uh, Could you just say that again? Uh, auto-condimentation, as opposed to pre-condimentation. That's, so that's when you have it, you know, sort of pre-condimentation. <laughs> we have the pepper and salt in. I'm just thinking you could have a whole hour talking about auto-condimentation versus pre-condimentation. <laughs> <laughs> Often, of course, it's used for political purposes. Like mm. Jargon is one of those things where you sort of tack together phrases. And I, Orwell had a wonderful line, and I'm probably going to misquote him, where he talked about phrases that were tacked together like a row of hen houses. <laughs> yes. I'm sure you've read George Orwell, and I'm sure he's been... How, how would have he influenced your thinking about how language and power are, are used, Kate? Yes, well, he was certainly one, wasn't he, with the idea that, you know, if you if you can't turn it into something that's readable or that can be understood, um, it's, you know, probably quackery that, you know, everything can be turned into something. You know, he's a little prescriptive sometimes in his um, in his style ideas, don't you think? It was, you know, he did sort of lay down the law a bit, but I did love some of the uh, the things that he noted. One thing he hated were those, what are they called, litotes, you know, a, a not unhappy, you know, these are politicians use this a lot, um, you know, a not insubstantial something or other. Um, and that's where you get the sort of two negatives, which are notoriously difficult to 
comprehend when we've got more than one negative. And then when you, when it's in a, in a sentence that has other negatives as well, it's it's really, really hard. So he had some sort of cure for it, which you had to get up in the morning and say, a not unblack dog placed a not unwhite <laughs> rabbit across a not ungreen field. And that would cure you of this. <laughs> uh, see, now that you say that, I think I'm guilty of saying something not unlike uh, in the past. And I think, yeah, mm. um, as I say it, I was thinking, oh, that's a bit mm. of a weaselly phrase. Just come out and yeah. say what you mean. It's sometimes you need the understatement. It's, it's always complex with language, isn't it? That's why I'm sort of not coming out dead against jargon because there's a place for it. Language is, there's not one size fits all, is there? And that's sometimes the mistake that people make, I think. Was there ever an idea that English could be settled one day and sort of fixed forever? Mm. Oh, yes. Early writers were, were hell-bent on, on this, particularly people like um, Jonathan Swift. You know, I, I understand that. They were fearful that their works wouldn't be able to be understood by future audiences. Of course, we can read uh, Jonathan Swift's works. We can read the works of the, the 1700s, but the, better than they could read the works sort of 300-odd years before them. You know, Chaucer is, was difficult for them as, and is impossible for us now, uh, the great medieval English poet, because we are coming off the back of a slower rate of change. But they wanted to fix it, you know, so they thought dictionaries, they thought grammar books would kind of work a bit like formaldehyde, I suppose, you know, and just kind of keep it in that state. But of course, if you fix the language, you kind of prevent that creativity, that wondrous use of language that we admire so much in writers like Jonathan Swift. You can't have it both ways and, of course, it's impossible. And, and all of the people at the, in that time, around the time of Jonathan Swift, who were actually in the business of making grammar books and, and dictionaries, and I've been looking at them recently, and I, you know, because they have a bad name in modern linguistics as being kind of rampantly prescriptive and this idea that they're going to fix or ascertain the language forever. But when you actually look at what they write about language, Samuel Johnson was one. You know, he went into his dictionary, which took him nine years to to make amazing piece of work. This you know, finally appeared in 1755. He had the idea of stopping words, fixing them. But then he realised he, you know, he couldn't. And it was vanity, he said, to, to think that he could do that. So it, people quickly learned. Uh, and there's a gorgeous definition or an account of words as being a bit like, a, you know, that slippery bar of soap in the bathtub. You know, you, you kind of put it in the in the container and out it goes again. I mean, you cannot pin them down. Uh, words will not sit still, I think is what T.S. Eliot said. Yeah, I've always liked Samuel Johnson because didn't he put in his own dictionary under the definition of lexicographer? And a lexicographer is <laughs> someone who makes a dictionary, <laughs> you yes, put a lexicographer, uh, a harmless drudge, was that it? <laughs> That's right, yes, yes. They, they were, you know, dictionaries at that time make for marvellous reading because there's so much of the personality of the of the lexicographer comes through and he hated French words, so he was always branding those with, you know, with barbarous or, you know, uh, lubricious barbarism or some sort of brand. And earlier um, dictionary makers used to use, you know, those daggers or obelisks and asterisks next to words they didn't like, they would also make up words too, you know. It must have been just, I don't know, hard to resist really because, you you know, you're making your dictionary and you think, oh, I think I'll pop that one in. <laughs> well, when I was in like 10 or 12 or something, one of the favourite activities in my last years of primary school was, you know, if you have to be in the library, you and a bunch of mates would pull out the dictionary and look up rude words and, <laughs> and snigger over them <laughs> and go, well, they're a rude word in the, in the dictionary. <laughs> what, what sort of issues do rude words, if that's the word for it, or, mm. or uh, bad language if that's even the word, I don't think it's necessarily bad. What what sort of issues do they present for someone like you as a linguist? Do you do you have to sort of kind of look hard at them and and what's motivating them and who's using them and who's not using them? I, I find them endlessly fascinating, probably because I had uh, you know an upbringing that that certainly did not encourage the use of these words. But th their life in dictionaries is is really interesting. Some early dictionaries, sort of in the 1600s, 1700s, did um, include them, but they were often well, always, sorry, not often, but defined in using Latin. Johnson himself, even though Johnson was not a polite man, he was a very rude man uh, and he loved all sorts of language, but he didn't put the full-blown obscenities in, which is interesting. There was only one, though, I, there was one person, one lexicographer that I 
uh, I should mention, and that's John Ash, and there must be a, a good story here because he was a Baptist minister. Uh, he was a divine as well. And he he had all of the full-blown obscenities in his dictionary with English definitions. He's the only one because these words were relegated to the dark continent of the world of words. You know, they just didn't, they didn't make an appearance until much more recently. Have they always been about sex and excrement or have they cha- has that changed over time? Oh, that's changed over time. It's whatever is taboo in society. So we've seen this kind of sweeping transition in English from kind of religious-based swear words to more physically, sexually-based swear words. And, of course, these days um, the taboos have shifted again. So, you know, if you take... Chaucer, the medieval poet, you know, he, I mean, he was very rude. He had the full gamut of, uh, of, of words at his... And there were, well, there was no censorship either. The, the medievals were totally smutty bastards mm, right from were. the get-go. <laughs> Quite right. Uh, so when they used... Uh, you say, like, religious slurs were was, was seen as, as taboo, mm. like calling someone a papist or something like that? Yeah, well, yes, and a, you know, heathen and a witch and all of these were much stronger. It's very hard to, to get the sense of these words now because, of course, they've been bleached of their of their potency and their pungency, but they were very, very powerful words then. I mean, even a word like bugger, I can say that on yeah, the program, oh yeah. can I? I put it in inverted commas, yeah. so it's, it's a quote. That was originally meant Bulgarian and it came into English from... Get um, out, it did. Yeah, it did, yes. So it was, a, it was a slur, very definitely, and then it came, you know, it's done all sorts of twists and turns that I probably won't go into here, but, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, so it came into English from French. Most people think that people swear much more now or swearing is more likely to be broadcast or published Mm. than it has been in the past. What will that do over time? Is that likely to take the sting out of it? And are swear words, even some of the most obscene, what had been thought to be the most obscene swear words, just more likely now just to seep into the... Mm. Everyday use. Okay. You're, you're quite right that they are very much more out there in the public arena, particularly on television. Radio is a bit more squeamish, though, don't you think? Um, you know, the, the, you don't hear them on radio. Well, you, yeah, but then then we get into the world of euphemism, and you can have a lot mm. of fun with euphemism. Like um, mm. a friend of mine once referred to, um, instead of referring to genitals in a crude term, she she referred to the bathing suit area, which I quite <laughs> like. <laughs> that reminds me of those below the waist words in the in yes. the Victorian era. You know, the indescribables and the mustn't mention them and the unwhisperables and unhintables. <laughs> there was, yeah, there were a, there was a flourishing of invisible words in the Victorian novel. <laughs> but it's funny, like if you if you talk about it that way, it sort of reintroduces the sting to it again, which is, which is kind of mm. fun. Yes, well, indeed. And my, my colleague Keith Allen, who I've worked with for a long, long time, he he talks about uh, euphemisms as being like diaphanous lingerie, I think is how he put it. You know? oh, that was... conceals only enough to be all the more titillating. Right. <laughs> so they're about the tease as much as the concealment. Then. Oh, I think so. I think so. Yes. Then euphemisms themselves, the polite words and phrases we use to talk about mm. you know, sex and excrement most of the time, mm. or, mm. Or, or death in, indeed. Mm-hmm. We think of the prim Victorians talking about limbs rather mm-hmm. than table legs or chair legs. Yes, yes. Like. But what about mm-hmm. us? What are we typically, uh, we moderns, we people in living in the 21st century, what do we use euphemisms for typically these days, Kate? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, taboos are dynamic and they will change with time and they will change from place to place. Um, you know, there are some that are very robust, People eating, I think, is probably the most robust taboo of all. And what's interesting there is, you know, you don't find the usual um, abundance of euphemisms for cannibalism that... Um, no, that's that you would true. Think, mm, yes. It's really interesting. It's very, very... I think it shows the severity of that taboo that we don't even have a sort of euphemistic language. We just simply don't talk about it. But death is another pretty robust one, and we think we're... we're Pretty up front with death, but you know we confront it all the time on on television. But that's of course you know sort of violent death in movies and in, you know the other people's death. When it's personal death, it's still still very very tricky. Um, and I think you you still find the euphemisms around that area. You know, I, past, I hate past. it, Kate. I really hate it. I have to <laughs> say, I'm sorry. This is me. But some, when we used to say someone has died, and then that got changed to passed away, and now mm. people can't even bring themselves mm. to say that they say, oh, he passed. Mm. And mm. it's it's like you know that. The person's dead, and yes. it's, it seems like a device to avoid grief mm. and, and the reality of. 
the end of life. Yes, some people just feel so uncomfortable saying it, and, uh, don't they, and that they have to resort to, to these words. But what, what's interesting, I think, about pass away and pass is that they are very old. They've been in the language for about 400 years. They, really? It sounds very modern. Yeah, so that's not the usual fate of a euphemism. I mean, euphemism is doomed to deteriorate, you know, because the next generation will grow up learning the euphemism as the direct term, so this kind of euphemistic magic will disappear uh, and they will be replaced, which is why you get these long, ever-changing chain of lexical replacements, you know, as, well, that you get around. Oh, and the fact that we have over 2,000, it's actually confirmed now, I think it's 2,500 terms for, for for genitalia in English. I mean, that, that's that's lexical richness. You know, it, English speakers always uh, uh, find it extraordinary that Inuit languages have all these words for snow. Why wouldn't they? And look at the lexical richness in your own language to look at the things that you really have trouble talking about. And that, so that's normally the, the lexical richness, the areas where you get lots and lots of near synonyms. They're the big taboo areas. And, and going back to pass away, it's unusual for a euphemism to last that long. I mean, sleep with. We've been sleeping with each other since Anglo-Saxon <laughs> times. You know, that's another one. Well, this brings us to Australian English now, Kate. And uh, the wonderful thing about Australian, <laughs> traditionally, Australian vulgar language is mm. that it sort of does, it's the same thing as a uni- euphemism, but to a completely different end. It talks around the subject. It uses mm-hmm. a metaphor, but to confront <laughs> the unpleasant <laughs> thing that's at the heart of it. Like an English person might say that he or she was as busy as a bee, but Mm -hmm. an Australian would say I'm flat out like a lizard drinking. Yeah, that's that's one of my favourites. And in fact, I think it's one of the favourites around Australia because we did a survey recently and that one came out really near the top. (laughs) Right. So Australian vulgarity does seem to often confront the the vulgar thing that everyone's Mm. trying to to turn around. Where where do we get that from? Is is this the Mm. the, the convict origins of modern Australia, the way we find this in? Most certainly that's our sort of love of the vernacular goes right back to those early days when English first came here and you've got to think what went into that linguistic melting pot, as linguists sometimes call it, you know, so it was the slang and dialect vocabularies of sailors and of whalers and of gold diggers. I've heard that the phrase fair dinkum comes from a uh, Cantonese or Hokkien phrase, which means fa dinkum or something like that, which means uh, good as gold, mm. solid gold. Yeah, no. no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, no. It's, um, it's a, a Derbyshire term meaning something like hard work. But, you know, it's interesting because linguists are always raining on people's picnics in this way, you know. No, it's not that. But the stories that people have about about their, you know, their favourite expressions are, are, I think, just as important to the history or the etymology of that expression. And and to my mind, it of it will explain the success of certain slang terms because let's face it, most slang doesn't survive. You know, only a handful will survive. We cre- we're creating slang all the time, even faster now than we were once. And you know, these days they have global take up. But, you know, which ones enter the dictionaries? Which ones become part of everyday language? To my mind, it's when, well, obviously they've got to feel, feel a need, but also people just have these great stories. OK is a really good example. OK is, is one of these um, lexical superstars that, um, you know, was around in the 1830s, uh, along with a whole other expressions. The source of it is um, a jokey misspelling or jokey abbreviation for all correct, and all correct was spelled O R L K. O double R E K T. So it was, you know, OK. And then, but there was also O all right, which was O W. So people played with that as well. So why didn't O W survive, but OK did? Well, then you've got to look at other things happening to, to OK. And suddenly OK became sort of used for out of cash or all coming with a, with a K as well, misspelling. And then it was played with because there was the OK Club. What was his name? Martin Van Buren. He was running for president in the States and he was known as Old Kinderhook. He had a nickname, and then they formed the OK Club. And but then came the stories. The boxers thought it was a boxing term because if you were, you were knocked out, KO'd, but you came good, you were OK. Um, so they play with the KO OK. <laughs> um, you know, then then some other thought. Oh, you know, so there are uh, must be about twenty different stories attached to OK, and I think that's really part of. You know, it's obviously captured our imagination and and these stories are important. A lot of the old Australian phrases that my father used to cherish have disappeared entirely. Like my dad used to say to me, he'd say, come on son, you're as slow as a wet week. 
or, yes. um, or, or sometimes more mysteriously, you'd say things to me like, you're full of piss and win like a barber's cat, son. And I don't know what that means or where that comes from. No, I've, got, no. I've got no idea. That's, that's kind of surreal if you think about it. And used to well, bewilder me at the time. But, but I'm pleased to report, Kate, that there's mm. um, the satirical mag, the Batuta mm. Advocate, the sat- mm-hmm. satirical website, uh, is reviving. Well, it's actually coining a whole lot of new Australian expressions. These guys are geniuses. Oh, that's the tradition of slang. You've got to play with it. I, I discovered this when my son told me uh, he was stepping out to get a brain tickle. And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? He went, it's a COVID test, Dad. That's, that's a phrase that's <laughs> coined by the Batuta advocate. Oh, that's lovely. And another phrase they've coined is the bachelor's handbag, which is a Coles chicken. So the headline was, local landscaper treats himself to the bachelor's handbag for Friday lunch. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> And my, my favourite, these guys are geniuses, my favourite phrase of theirs is, is a Bricky's laptop. That's, 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 their, that's their phrase for a poker machine in a pub. Oh, that's very good. And, you know, some of these might take off. Look at Barry Humphreys. He, he played with this, I think, flat out like a lizard drinking is, was one of his. Yeah, Point Percy at the Porcelain was another yes. one he invented. He yes. invented, yeah. Oh, but he also used to, he said he used to hear builders, when his dad was a builder, he made, made houses in the suburbs of Melbourne, he sit sit um, having billy tea with the builders and one would step up and say, I'm just off to strain the potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I love it. It's, it's so much a part of playing the verbal play, isn't it, that's so crucial to our use of language and, and you see that in slang. And, you know, so you can take an expression, I don't know what's a good expression, an Australian one, like um, f- fair go, which, you know, spawned fair crack of the whip and then fair fair suck of the sauce bottle and yeah. then, you know, fair suck of the Siberian Sanchu or something. There's a, there's a whole lot of Yeah, fair suck yeah, of the Yeah, exactly. Sab, yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. Is Australian slang dying out despite the Batuta Advocate's best efforts? <laughs> yeah, people worry endlessly. Yeah. No, it's not. I can tell you it's alive and well and really? we're actually exporting it, so, so don't worry. What do you mean? How are we exporting it? Well, look at Selfie. You know, That's it's Australian? It is a, it's not only Australian. It made a first appearance in the ABC. It's a pity you don't get royalties for that one, you know. <laughs> 2002. But the interesting thing is, and this is, again, part of the mystery of, of the lexicon, is it didn't really take off until, I think it was 2013, when it when it increased something like 17,000% in that one year. And that's why it got word of the year. It was even word of the year in, in Holland. Has the term budgie smugglers taken off internationally? Yes. Mm, that's one that we're exporting, yes. <laughs> well, I think we can be proud of that, can't we? So if some countries. words and phrases slide into the language because they're patently witty and sort of very much mm. off the moment, why do they slide out again? Do they lose... Do we, do we get sort of tired of the joke? Is that what happens? Yeah, yeah quite right. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. It's, um, I mean, it's just a sort of fact of... Uh, linguistic life that words will wear out and we want to find newer, ex- more exciting ways of saying something. But some aspects of the language will wear out faster, so slang will. I mean, for slang to be slangy, for sl- it's got to attract attention. Uh, and that's why it's so interesting when you get certain slang words, well, like cool, cool or dude. I mean, they've been around since the 1800s. Those two words are still not only in the language, but they're still scruffy. They're still slangy. They still pack a bit of a punch. I thought cool came into the language into the, in the 60s and dude in the 80s. No, 1800s. The dudes were very different, though. The dudes were kind of the fops and dandies of the 1800s, the fancy dresses. You should see some of the pictures of the early dudes. <laughs> wow. Now, you'd think in Australia, because of the great distances that separates people in Darwin from Melbourne and from Mm. Perth, that there would be much more diversity of accents and language, the use of English. Why, Mm. Why is that not the case? It is interesting because you do need kind of physical and also social separation for variation to start happening because people, of course, want to uh, accentuate their difference. The, the, it goes back to that linguistic melting pot I meant, mentioned earlier. So what happens when you get a whole bunch of dialects coming together? And that would have happened when, you know, with those dialects that came across to Britain all those years in the 5th century, they go through this kind of levelling effect so that the, what climbs out of the melting pot is fairly uniform. And there were these mini melting pots all around the country, if you think of kind of the wool industry and the gold rushes. So whenever you got any kind of regional diversity happening, you got a whole flood of other people coming in, you know, for the gold with different accents again. So you got uniformity. It's changing now. We are getting, you are getting some vowel differences, for example, between... Well, if we think of Melbourne or that classic Melbourne vowel, which is Malbon. Malbon, um, yes, yes, yes. 
but really not not much at all. I grew up in Perth, and there, there is, of course, the dance-dance difference, France-France, but that's tied up. That's just not regional, only regional. It's tied up with social and also stylistic difference. So people who might say dance normally or, or advance will sing advance Australia fair, you know, so they'll trot out what's perceived to be a posh aval. Do you have any theories on why English has been so successful? Is it just like power, colonialism, is it that it? Or is there uh, are there sort of aspects or mechanisms within English that have helped it catch on? No, it's it's it, there are no linguistic reasons for why one language will. I'm always nervous saying this word luck out because I know for half your audience <laughs> they'll understand luck out to be in a lucky position and the other half will understand to be in an unlucky <laughs> position. But, but, but why English lucked out, in other words, was successful, it's not for any linguistic reason, but it's indeed, as you say, it's piggybacking on, you know, all of these other events, you know, economic, political. The fact that, uh, you know, all those pink bits on the map, um, you know, sent English all around the world and and then it became in those places a, a useful lingua franca where you had incredible linguistic diversity in those places and so you know English became a sort of a, a neutral everyday you know language it was handy but the interesting thing is to speculate you know what would have happened if say you know America North America had been uh, German speaking which could have happened. That, that, then, it's then, a whole different world we're living in then, isn't it? It could mm. have happened. I think the Germans were the second largest group of mm. migrants to North America and mm. it could have happened. There were German-speaking communities all over the United States, north and yes. south, in Texas, yeah. in Wisconsin, in Minnesota. That could have happened. It, it's a really interesting question, that one, and you can just see a whole different world we're mm. living in. W- would English have become the sort of you know global... Village lingua franca. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've so enjoyed this conversation, <laughs> Kate. <laughs> As have I. Thank you. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Professor Kate Burridge is Professor of Linguistics at Monash University. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Hi, Miyuki Okiranta here. If you like stories that get at the heart of human experience, then I'd love it if you checked out my podcast, Earshot, where we eavesdrop on life as it's lived. I think I just held my dad's hand and just hoped that I was going somewhere safe. We're kicking off a new season and it's all about promises. Made, broken, kept and stretched. I couldn't promise that she would have a great life because you can never promise it to any child. But I promised that she would have a life and that I would look after her and be there for that life. His funding's been stripped. Like, stripped. I wanted to be metaphorically the dying person in the room. I wanted the members of parliament who were going to oppose this law to say it to my face. Just search for Earshot on the ABC Listen app and I'll catch you there. Love is great, but sometimes that's not enough. Promise me?